Yep. So thanks everybody for attending today's presentation and welcome to this week's webinar. As always, we'd like to thank our sponsors from IAS, which allow us to offer all of these resources free of charge. This includes recorded lectures, the learning tools, and even virtual field trips. So make sure you take a look at our website to see all the new info. So today's lecture is by Dr. Bart Ritterberg and Kanexa and Tever, who are research geomechanic, me, uh, geomechanics and carbonate geologists from Shell. Dr. Berber got his master's and PhD degrees from the uh, Utah University. His research interests include experimental work related to deformational processes in reservoirs. And Dr. Tever got her master's from the Autonomous University of Barcelona and the PhD degree from the University of Bar Barcelona. Her research interests are in carbonate sedimentology and diagenesis, as well as carbonate reservoir properties and fluid rock interactions. So I'll give you the floor and we look forward to a great presentation. Thank you very much, Simone, for their wonderful uh, introduction. And thanks, conveners, for offering this uh, opportunity to uh, talk about the effect of stress and the acoustic properties of carbonate rocks. It, it really is the outcome or, or work in progress, partly. And what I'm going to present to you today is really um, the outcome of, uh, of research done in the past few years. Um, Luke Kleipol and Conchita played a, a huge role in this uh, as well. Um, so let me begin with an outline. Um, I will give you an overview of the key challenges uh, that are related to uh, carbonates and acoustic properties of carbonates in particular. Then I'll give an overview of the samples and experimental methods that uh, we applied, data analysis methods, results, interpretation, and um, of course, closing with the conclusions. So just to give you a little bit of a teaser, I want to begin with the research aims and, and what, we, what I think um, we can convince you of today as well. So, the, the research program is really aimed at understanding the rock physical properties controlling wave propagation in carbonates. And today I'll be addressing the role of stress state. And I hope to convince you that stress state indeed plays an important role in controlling ultrasonic velocity properties in carbonates. And that uh, acoustic characterization of rock really should be carried out under in situ conditions. Uh, thanks to the, the sample suite uh, that we chose, we can say something about the role of pore type uh, and, and about the role of composition. In particular, we find uh, that micropores limestones have low stress or pore pressure sensitivity compared with samples dominated by uh, vuggy uh, pores or molds. And um, you know, on the role of composition, we in fact found that, that there is little difference in stress or pore pressure sensitivity between samples with high versus low grain density in these dolostone dominated core samples. Um, so as a bit of a, a, a background or motivation, I should say. So carbonates are characterized as you all know very, very well, I think is that carbonates are characterized by a complex depositional environment uh, that is then and often have a strong diagenetic overprint. Um, therefore they show heterogeneity on multiple length scales shown for example in this uh, this core uh, that was taken from um, from a limestone reservoir um, this heterogeneity on multiple land scales and in terms of porosity mineralogy and pore shape as well as you can show in this image very uh, very nicely it makes that the rock properties of carbonates are difficult to predict using sonic tools and seismic data and and this in turn offers major challenges for exploration and development um, in uh, of carbonate reservoirs so um why do we want this? Uh, uh, how do we, why do we want to predict porosity from acoustic velocity? So velocity porosity correlations are used for the core to log the seismic calibration and, and therewith in, in essence to gain an, an image of the subsurface we need to understand what the, uh, the waves uh, that pass through it actually mean. Now for simple empirical transforms that is a, basically a relation between P wave velocity and porosity, and a line in this plot, if you like, simple transforms in this way are okay for siliciclastic rock types. And you can see that in this plot I took from Lo et al. in um, a paper from Lo et al. In, in 2019, just an example. Um, these are shales and sandstones. And what you can see is that the variation for a single porosity is up to about a thousand meters per second. This sounds bad, but in fact, it's quite good. And you can fit um, the data reasonably well with a simple uh, transform. 
However, if you compare it with carbonates and on the plot to the, to the right here, you can see that uh, the scatter is much worse. Uh, what you see is that for a single porosity, the P wave velocity may range up to 3,600 meters per second. And uh, this, this causes, this introduces a major in uncertainty for, um, uh, uh, for seismic inversions and, 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 and uh, therewith offering ma major challenges for exploration and development. So the question really is what causes this disper dispersion? Um, so what are the factors controlling acoustic properties of carbonates? From previous work, we know that porosity plays a big role, poor shape, size, type, mineralogy, as well as bedding lamination and fractures, that, uh, uh, that those play a huge role in controlling this, uh, this spread in data points. But what's less considered in the literature is the, is the direction of stress and stress magnitude in particular, laboratory conditions in particular, isostatic conditions versus deviatoric stress conditions. I will be talking a lot about this later on, um, but also simply the time taken for an experiment. Uh, if you think of time dependent deformation processes, these uh, are, are, have a, can have a major effect uh, depending also on the rock type and the conditions on, um, uh, these can have a major effect on, on acoustic properties. Um, so, to date, uh, just to give you a taste of what's done in the, in the rock physics modeling realm, if you like, to, to, to what's done to date is to com capture the complexity of carbonates. Um, um, to capture this complexity, we use very simplified microstructural models. And these extremely simple uh, models are, uh, are, are, are introduced to generate first order velocity porosity transforms. And uh, just these equations, essentially these simple relations between P wave velocity and porosity um, that include carbonate heterogeneity. And there's an example of this, you and Payne in 2009, a very uh, a much used and famous uh, paper. It essentially introduces stiff spherical pores versus compliant and ellipsoidal elongated pores. I've summarized or took this from their uh, paper in 2009. And um, yeah, using this simple model, they generate various uh, uh, transforms. Uh, you can uh, tweak this with, um, with, with a few simple empirical parameters, and you can then fit that to the data, and this gives you a, a simple velocity velocity transform. It's, it's, for various reasons, it's not entirely uh, satisfying though. And one major, um, uh, one very, another very popular model in this realm is the Sun uh, model in, in 2004, pub published and expanded later on. Um, this models the, the porosity velocity of the P wave velocity porosity relationship using a so called frame flexibility factor, uh, in, in, indeed, also an empirical um, uh, dimensionless parameter. I, yeah, it's certainly empirical. Um, and this has a link to the 3D pore structure. And these images summarize the, the usefulness of this, uh, this modeling. Um, I took this from a presentation by Vega et al. in 2011 at the AEPG annual convention. Um, what you see is that for the uh, more foggy samples or uh, samples, uh, carbonate samples with larger porosity, these plot very well in a region uh, that is characterized by low frame, frame flexibility, whereas the uh, mi more micropore samples at so the bottom row of micrographs I'm using here, what I'm pointing out here, um, are, um, are plot very well with, uh, with a high frame flexibility. So this, this, these rock physics models enable us or give us ways to capture these, this typical gunshot of, uh, of uh, velocity porosity data that we gain, that we obtain from the lab. And therewith, we can improve the quartal log calibration. Um, now let's turn back to the work that uh, we did actually. Um, so first describing samples. So we use two sample suites. Um, core W consists of 11 plug samples of Pennsylvanian dolus stone that has shaley and sandy intervals. This is a core that was extracted from 1.1 to 1.5 kilometers depth. And this is, characterized by compositional variation. You can see some laminae in this image um, and the color variations are also suggestive of uh, compositional variation. But most importantly, the grain density is seen to vary from 2.66 to 2.86 in the various plugs that we used. 
Core A samples, by contrast, these are 19 plug samples. These are consist of near pure limestone, as seen in the uh, grain density as well. Um, this limestone was extracted from 3.3 to 3.4 kilometers depth, so quite a bit deeper than the, uh, the, um, the core W samples. I forgot to mention that the limestone, these limestones are from the Miocene. Um, and the interesting, the particularly interesting aspect of these, this sample suite is that these are characterized by widely varying pore types. So um, we have vuggy samples, moldic uh, samples, or more moldic samples, microporous samples. I will be coming back to that uh, later on. Um, important to mention from a mechanical side, experimental side, is that all plugs are uh, 1.5 inches in diameter by two inches long. This is uh, optimal for our present type of measurements where we are focusing on acoustic properties. Um, so coming back to this core A sample set, the, um, I mentioned varying port types. The relative abundance of the main port types was gauged as a visual estimate of the contribution to the bulk pore system uh, from light microscope analysis of sections as shown here on the right. Um, so this was used as a basis to identify micropores samples. These are characterized or dominated, I should say, by skeletal molds and relatively large uh, fugs, larger than 0.75 millimeters. Mesopore samples, which are dominated by intercrystalline interparticle pores, interfossil fracture porosity, and relatively small fugs. And lastly, micropore samples, which are dominated by pores smaller or equal to four micron in size. So it's a semi-quantitative subdivision, if you like, based on, on thin section evaluation of the carbon trim ends, of the trim ends of the, the carbon plugs. Now, experimental method. So we used our sample set to deform in a triaxial loading apparatus. For us, let me give you a bit of background on this. Um, Flosti measurements, as I mentioned in the earlier slides, are often done under isotropic stress conditions. This means that you take a, a sample and you basically um, and place it in a, in a vessel and you can increase the, the, the oil or a vessel which is filled with uh, confining fluid, oil in this case. So this, this image was taken from a famous paper from 1993. The sample is submerged in this oil and the pressure of the oil is uh, ramped up and you can control the pore fluid pressure independently from the confining pressure, but that's it. It means that the, the axial pressure or stress is the same as the, ax, as the radial stress and you achieve isotropic stress conditions. This is not really, although it's good and you can do a lot of measurements, there's a lot of advantages because you can do a lot of measurements in, in, in a short time. Disadvantage is that rocks in reality are really subject to deviatoric stress conditions as well as stress changes related to, for example, um, production, uh, pore fluid pressure decrease. Uh, so, so what happens to the P wave velocity as you decrease pore pressure, for example? Um, yeah, deviatoric stress condition, I should point out, it means that the axial stress is not the same as the radial stress. So you have, a, for example, a larger axial stress, an overburden pressure, for example, compared with the radial uh, stress, which is the local stress field in, in many cases. Um, so in, in, in our lab, we, um, we, we use triaxial loading apparatus, triaxial loading apparatus to measure VPVS and the loading apparatus here sketched on the right. Um, we measure VPVS under differential stress using pore pressure, axial stress and radial stress simulating in situ reservoir conditions. And we apply stress changes simulating pore pressure uh, depletion. Okay, as yeah, so in the sketched sample is located here in the center, and uh, we we measure acoustic velocity using these ultrasonic transducers, which are located in the piston end caps. So essentially, we 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 use the source to shoot a, a wave and a, uh, at a certain frequency through the sample, and we uh, look at, look at the arrival time at the uh, at the receiving end. So these images show one of the machines, uh, or photos show one of a few, two of the machines, one a cross section, and you see the sample in the center. Um, important is notice that we can control axial stress and radial stress independently. Okay, so uh, testing protocol. This is uh, what you see in this uh, uh, plot here. Is a 
is stress or pressure versus time. So this is an experiment and testing protocol that uh, for experiments that last up to 100 hours. And what we do in each experiment is to apply two and a half isotropic loading cycles. Okay, so we ramp up the axial stress and the radial stress. This is the green and the red line simul simultaneously. And um, we, this is followed by axial loading at constant mean stress or radial stress. Constant mean stress is the yellow strand line. Uh, radial stress is, uh, is this part here. And then we impose reservoir stress conditions to uh, the plugs uh, under which we imply, impose pore pressure depletion cycles at a constant ratio of the radial stress over the uh, change in the radial stress over the change in pore pressure. Now, essentially, this is where we simulate uh, pore pressure drawdown from a from a reservoir. Um, importantly, to mention in in the data analysis part is that we select from this data we select 13 key straight stress states uh, N and M, which I designate N and M, for comparison for internal comparison of the the P and S wave velocity, um, and we calculate the stress or pressure sensitivity between these test states N and M. So that's for example, if you want to know what happened, if you want to evaluate what happened uh, to the sample and uh, what the effect of, of this isotropic stress cycling was on the acoustic uh, velocity, you can uh, look at the, diff at the difference essentially between 0.3 and 0.1 or stress state 3 and 1 and so on. Okay. Um, for those who are um, uh, acquainted with these, uh, this type of QP plots, this is a plot of differential stress and mean effective stress. It's, it's much used in the, in the geomechanics community. Um, yeah, this is the, the shape of the, of the QP uh, diagram for each experiment. Okay, so this is the, the um, uh, yeah, the, the part where we increase actual stress at constant mean stress, and this is the differential stress increase on pore pressure cycling and at constant radial stress. So I'd like to point out that we measure axial and radial strain during these experiments as well. So the ex so I'm using the same um, diagram as you showed as I showed before. So stress or pressure versus time, but now plotting the result at a measured value of strain uh, on the on using the right axis for that other axis on the right. And compaction is, is means positive uh, change in strain. So notice how the axial strain and the radial strain are nicely following these isotropic stress cycles here. So we increase the pressure and the sample shortens just a little bit. Um, we measure P and S waves uh, each 150 to 200 seconds along the axial direction. So if you remember the, this is a, a, a section of the, uh, the section of the triaxial loading apparatus. Here's the sample, and we measure the P and S wave velocity along this direction. In this plot, now I added the wave velocity, which we measured. So P, the P wave would be the brown line, and the S wave is the purple line. It's a bit of a busy plot. I won't bother you with this for the rest of the presentation, but just to show this is the data that we obtain in these experiments. So how do we pick these, these waveforms? It's, in my view, an important part to treat as well. Just real quick. So we transmit an 800 kilohertz uh, sinusoid through the plug. We obtain then hundreds of waveforms per experiment. So that's what you see here. This is a waveform. And this is the time that of recording the waveform. Now, if you zoom in, then you here I highlight three waveforms. Essentially, what you do is you pick the arrival time um, uh, of course, we have algorithms to help us with this, but you pick the arrival time. In this case, we, we pick the zero crossing and yeah, using the proper calibrations, we can then calculate the, um, uh, and, and of course, the length of the samples. Then we can calculate uh, the velocity um, at a certain point in the stress path. Notice this, this, this pattern here, and that actually reflects the isotropic loading cycles. Um, so now finally, let's get on with the results. Now I'm showing you here a plot of P wave velocity against porosity for the core A samples. These are the limestones. I'm going to begin with the result of a single test. So one data point plotted here uh, represents the mean value over 10 measurements. You can, it's important information, but you can forget about it uh, for now. Um, the error for each measurement is smaller than the symbol size. Okay, so we nicely quantified that, but it's 
falls uh, beyond below the resolution of this uh, diagram. Um, so what we do is we measure the P wave velocity in this case at state one. Now we do the same for all states one through 13. So we obtain th 13 data points for a single experiment. Okay, and what you can see nicely for this, uh, this test A70 is that uh, had this, this nice evolution uh, from state one through 13. So I'll, I'll highlight that later. If you do that for all experiments, this is what it looks like. Um, we find a total range of P-wave velocity uh, of 3.2 to 4.3 kilometers per second um, per test. So for per individual test, just, just focus on this test A70 here again, um, we see a, uh, a maximum or horizontal spread of about uh, 0 0.08 to 0.46%. So that's the pro maximum porosity change, if you like, during the experiment. And the vertical spread is up to 360 meters per second. So it's quite a lot. Uh, uh, just nah. um, What's also interesting to see is that, and let's, is that um, if you follow the change in porosity with increasing steps, so just I'm, I'm, I'm color coding the uh, the markers here using step one through 13 eh, from blue to yellow. If you if you just follow the, with increasing step, you see that porosity usually uh, continuously decreases up to about here. And then for the last few steps, the uh, or stress states, if you like, the porosity seems to have increased slightly uh, with respect to the former. Um, on the other hand, P wave velocity first increases and then decreases with increasing step. Okay, and this is, I'm highlighting this experiment and in fact, for most tests, you can find this, uh, recognize this pattern. There's also a few obvious outliers and you might've noticed this one already. This is a sample that failed. Okay, so if you would plot stress versus strain, this one would show an obvious uh, drop in, in stress at a certain point. It means that during the experiment, a crack uh, uh, formed or uh, uh, something that uh, changed the microstructure of the, of the plug significantly such that you can, can't really use it anymore. I plot it anyway, just to highlight the outliers um, or to show the outliers. Uh, last thing I'd like to mention is that I'm plotting, I'm, I'm plotting here the Raymer Hunt Gardner empirical velocity porosity transform as for calcite, as well as the Willie's time average uh, velocity porosity transform. These are, for those who are familiar with this, this these are very famous or very classical transforms uh, used in petrophysics for uh, for a wide range of rock types. Notice that the, the match is quite poor, except for the trend. The trend though is quite reasonable. We see a decreasing, um, uh, yeah, decreasing VP with increasing porosity. Now, quickly, the, an overview of the, the S waves uh, for core A as well. We find a total range of 1.7 to 2.5 kilometers per second. And per test, excluding again this, 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 this strange outlier, you see a vertical spread of up to 180 meters per second. This is, of course, the same. The horizontal spread is, of course, the same as for P wave. And importantly, we find reasonable range of um, P wave over S wave velocities ratio. This is to give some confidence uh, about the uh, quality of the picking. Um, now for court W, this, uh, this is the Dolo Stone dominated samples. Um, here we find a total range of 3.7 to 6.4 kilometers per second for the P wave. And notice this, this is quite a lot and uh, quite a lot, uh, quite a lot more spread than uh, compared with the um, uh, limestone. Um, per test, however, the spread is less in the sense that we find a vertical uh, spread of maximum 200 meters per second and a horizontal spread also is much less, 0.14% compared with 0.46%. Um, and for the S wave velocities, um, now total range of 2.2 to 3.9 kilometers per second, um, or yeah, 3.7, actually, I think it's a typo. And per test, we see um, a, a maximum vertical uh, spread of 130 meters per second. And again, the P to S wave velocity ratio is reasonable in our assessment. Now let's let's have a look. Let's compare the 
effect of um, let's compare stress states the effect the effect of stress states and an m on uh, core a so again remember this plot of stress or pressure versus time showing the testing protocol okay so what we imposed on the sample and now first going to compare the 0.3 and 1 okay using this formula i'm plotting here in a bar diagram and each shaded region is a different comparison but i'm first going to look at comparison a uh, three with one what you see is that the effect of isotropic stress cycling is essential it's essentially very small we see for most samples with a few clear outliers such as this a64 test here uh, you see a small positive value of delta vp in, implying a small positive increase of uh, the PV, pv velocity Similarly, if you uh, increase axial stress at constant mean stress or at constant radial stress, you see an increase of uh, VP of about 2%. And interestingly, there's little difference um, between the shaded parts B and C. So, and, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm ignoring the, um, the outliers here, in particular the black one. Um, then when we look at the, when we compare eyes of a reservoir condition, so 0.8 here in the testing protocol with 0.5, which is uh, isotropic conditions, you find uh, a, a quite a large positive increase up to 4% for most samples. And um, upon uh, imposing uh, pore pressure drawdown, so comparing 0.11 with 0.10, okay, um, you also find a positive increase of uh, VP of, um, yeah. And um, lastly, we also find negative values of uh, VP. This is when you compare 0.13 with 0.3, for example, and 0.12 with 0.8. So essentially what you're doing here is assess the effect of cumulative, of the cumulative effect of pore pressure cycling. And um, this, is, uh, this is F and you see indeed for most samples a negative value of delta VP. Um, now, um, for core W, I'm just going to highlight a few differences compared with the uh, the limestone core A. Um, if here we found, in fact, that the difference between reservoir stress, the difference in VP between reservoir conditions and isotropic conditions is very minimal, and then what we see for most samples is, in fact, a small negative value of uh, of, of delta VP. And um, also interestingly the cumulative effect of poor pressure cycling is negligible or slightly positive for most samples. So what are the key observations from this delta VP? How am I doing in time? Uh, am I still okay? 40 minutes now. Um, for all samples, we found little to no effect of isotropic loading cycles on, uh, on P-wave velocity. We found an equivalent increase of VP when increasing axial stress under constant mean stress or under constant radial stress conditions. And delta VP is up to two plus two percent upon poor pressure drawdown under reservoir conditions. Yeah. Um, interestingly, core A samples showed in particular and showed uh, up to four percent increase of VP under reservoir conditions versus near isostatic conditions, whereas very ne near, nearly negligible for the dollarstone dominated samples. And we found uh, down to 3% decrease of uh, up to 3% decrease of VP due to the cumulative effect of pore pressure cycling or deviatoric loading compared to negligible effect for pore pressure cycling um, of the core W samples. Also importantly, um, there's generally smaller delta VP for core W compared with core A samples. Didn't really highlight this because uh, I used different scales, but um, I guess uh, I hope you can take my word for that. Now let's have a look at the stress or pore pressure sensitivity of the P wave velocity. This is from core A samples. First, um, what I'm showing you here is a plot of this S value. This is the uh, der derivative of VP against uh, axial stress or pore pressure um, uh, for sections of the uh, of the testing protocol. Okay, section of the sections of the data. So, for example, point of shaded part air one here is the S value calculated for the section between three and four. Okay, that's the essentially you're looking at the change in axial stress at a constant mean stress. 
and we're asking okay what is vp doing in this uh, in this uh, when you do that when you apply that and impose that change also important to mention you probably noticed I subdivided here, uh, used three panels for micropores, mesopores, and macropore samples. So finally, uh, this is what we found from inspection of the carbonate uh, uh, sections. Um, this is a difference in, in, in pore size and type uh, that we made from the, from the start. So let's go through this again. First, uh, for all three sample types, we find, um, an increase of, we find positive values of S um, when you increase the axial stress at constant mean stress or constant radial stress. And um, we found very small values of S, so nearly zero, when you increase axial stress at the same rate as you increase the radial stress or, or, or pore pressure. So that's hydrostatic loading. That would be this interval here. And lastly, we find negative values of S um, when you, upon, on, uh, when you, um, impose pore pressure drawdown. What I forgot to mention, but what's really important actually, is that notice that the amplitude of the bars between micropores, mesopores, and macropores samples is quite a bit different. In fact, for all categories, for one, two, five, for each uh, yeah, evaluated um, sensitivity, we find uh, that the micropore samples show only a small amplitude, only up to about one per GPA. Whereas the mesopores and macropore samples uh, show a much larger amplitude, except for the hydrostatic loading part. Okay, that's all the same. But for the other categories, it's um, for the other slopes, it's um, it's quite a bit larger. Um, for core W samples, we made a subdivision based on grain density. So on the left, you see um, samples with a grain density lower than 2.8, on the right larger than 2.8, and um, now, I don't really want to go through it. Again, the most important, I think, the message is that the, uh, the, the main observations that we found for the limestone apply to the dollar stone as well. There were a few outliers. I think this W05 test uh, showed some strange results. So to summarize these observations on the S values, we find equivalent um, sensitivity of VP to increasing axial stress on the constant mean stress versus on the constant radial stress. P wave velocity is insensitive for hydrostatic loading. So S value of nearly zero. And um, for core A samples under uh, pore pressure, when we decrease pore pressure on the reservoir conditions, we find um, now differences between micropores, mesopores and macropore samples. I think I, I pointed that out to, uh, quite clearly uh, previously, in previous slides. Um, yeah, smaller S values for micropore samples versus meso and micropore samples. Um, for the uh, court W samples, the S value is lower than, uh, is negative for pore pressure cycles under reservoir conditions. And there's no striking differences in the magnitude of S between samples with high versus low grain density. So how do we interpret these results? So what we start with is to realize that uh, Sears and Khachanov is an important paper from the 90s. They pointed out that elastic wave velocities are reduced in the presence of open microcracks and fractures. And, and if you think about this, this, this applies to our, uh, to our results quite, quite well. So all samples that we use will contain pre-existing cracks and certainly they will contain uh, grain boundaries which are more or less open and when you start to pressurize them uh, these will part uh, these will slightly close now when you as a, as a result of the imposed stress when you assess the uh, effect of isotropic stress cycling so this this first comparison that we made you might see a small decrease of increase in VP due to time dependent closure of the, uh, of, the, of the cracks and grain boundaries. But overall, the effect is very small. And, and that's, that's what we re recognize in these uh, samples as well, excluding this outlier, which likely so failed uh, during the experiment. Um, however, when you impose deviatoric stress state, as we did in the comparison, uh, which is underlying the comparison really between um, uh, B and of comparisons B to E, um, 
put imposing a divitoric stress state, cracks in grain boundaries will close preferentially along the direction of the first principal compressor stress, as, as illustrated here. And what you will notice is an increase in VP. So that that explains the um, the uh, the in, yeah the positive values in this plot. However, um, uh, if you compare the or assess the effect of divitoric or differential stress uh, or sustained differential stress, such as when you compare 0 0.13 with, with three here or uh, 12 with eight. Um, and so to assess the effect of cumulative, uh, cumulative effect of pore pressure drawdown, you're essentially increasing the differential stress. Um, this may lead to yield of the sample and therewith to opening of micro cracks and, uh, and, and decrease of VP. Um, also, also, if you unload the sample, you may relax the, the, the you're relaxing the stress state, essentially you're reopening cracks or grain boundaries. Um, as for the S values, uh, the sign of, uh, that is the, the sensitivities, the stress or poor pressure sensitivities, the sign of the S values is controlled by the direction of change of actual stress or poor pressure. So this, these are negative values because we decrease poor pressure. If you look at, if you would use actual effective stress, which makes, actually makes a lot of sense to use that as a, as a way to calculate the S value, um, you would get positive values for these, uh, these categories as well. And what we, yeah, what we postulate is that the magnitude of S is affected by crack population. So more cracks implies higher stress uh, or, or yeah, stress or poor pressure sensitivity. So now to wrap up the conclusions, we saw that stress state plays an important role in controlling VPVS. Differential stress or actual effective stress may lead to closure and or opening of micro cracks and grain boundaries, which strongly affect uh, the PU and S wave velocity. Limestone samples showed higher, up to 4% uh, uh, higher VP under reservoir stress conditions compared with under isostatic conditions. So we strongly suggest that acoustic property characterization of reservoir rock should really be carried out under stress conditions simulating the reservoir. Um, and um, limestone samples that are characterized by dominant porosity smaller than four micron in size. So these are the, the micropore samples. These showed smaller stress or pore pressure sensitivity than compared with samples characterized by dominant larger pores. And lastly, I'd like to point out that the taller stone dominated core samples showed little differences in stress or pore pressure sensitivity despite the uh, compositional variation. So thank you very much um, for attending this uh, talk. And, and if you have questions beyond this seminar, please do reach out to, uh, to this email address. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Bart. That was a very interesting talk. Um, so the chat is now open. So if anybody has questions, please feel free to submit them to the chat and make sure you send them to everybody and include where you're watching from and who you are. And I will read them out and uh, Bart and um, can answer them. Uh, so just as we're waiting for our first question, um, I can ask one. <laughs> yeah, please go ahead. Everybody, um, all questions are welcome. So what are some of like the more real world applications to like calculating these reservoir effects? Um, that's an excellent question and very relevant, of course, uh, uh, working in the industry as well. Um, well, what one important application that we try to achieve is to improve this core to log calibration and to, to un better understand. So we, we get the sonic log and we get seismic data. We have lots of that, but we want to know what it means in terms of porosity, permeability, etc. So we want to improve that understanding, if you like. Another um, application that I that, that we have in mind really, um, and and what I've been talking about a lot is this this pore pressure and stress sensitivity. What you could think of is 4D seismic, eh, where you do size monitoring and look at time shifts of the re of of your uh, seismic data, um, and try to understand what these changes actually mean in in the reservoir. I showed you that the micropore samples, at least these preliminary results, okay, suggest a higher stress sensitivity. Now you could 
potentially translate that to a change in time shift signal. Uh, this is just very hypothetical, but uh, uh, that that would be a real world application, I think. Yeah. Um, so we have a question in the chat from Jay Riemer in Holland. What will be the effect of differences in carbonates when you compare tropical carbonate carbonates, so st stiff structures, with cool water carbonates with loose grains? Yeah. Um, I would expect that the stiffer carbonate would more uh, would be much more like the um, micropore samples, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, whereas the the less stiff samples were more corresponding with the the micropore samples, that's as the vuggier samples. Um, let, let me ask a question to John yeah. for for uh, to, to to try and clarify to see if I understand correctly. When you say loose grains, do you mean without cementation, or uh, what do we understand for these cold water carbonates in origin, but then cemented, or just loose grains? And thanks for the question, by the way, John. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's not clear to me because um yeah I'd be surprised that we would try to to measure any to do any measurement if it's completely loose grains and not cemented. So his um, clarification oh, okay. for that I, is, I, I is read. at the beginning they are loose grains but they will be cemented very late. Okay, but uh, that will be the effect of differences in when you compare it. Now, if you look at the effect of stiffness, I would say that stiffer samples behave elastically and longer and more elastically compared with the less yeah. stiff samples. And you'd get um, less change in um, yeah, the sample is essentially more rigid when you apply, uh, when you change the stress. So, yeah. I would, I would expect that the sensitivity is much smaller. Yeah, that's what I would say. All right. I think Luke, um, is Luke on the line? Maybe if Luke has some smart comments about this, then uh, you're welcome to intervene. <laughs> Unfortunately, Luke's not turned up yet. No, Luke oh. is not, cannot join. I did, uh, but, but I'm still to fail. I don't know, maybe we can follow up with John because I'm failing to understand really if, the question is if we are measuring the VPVS in the lab of loose grains, or if we say, well, when these loose grains will become a rock, because if they would become a rock, then it will depend if it's going to be more or less cemented, if it will have more buggy or less buggy porosity, or, and, and I'm, I might not understand it fully the question. So I don't know, maybe it's an idea that we follow up with John offline or, or, or we try to understand better the question. I don't know what could be better. Yeah, that's a good idea. Maybe follow up at another time. Yeah, because I th John is an expert on, on these matters. And of course, for sure, he's, uh, he's steering into a direction. But um, maybe I, I, I specifically fail to understand. Yeah, John, if it would be possible, it would be great to set up a, a chat with you. Yeah. All right. So the next question is from Thomas. Uh, thanks for the talk. Would you say that the range of delta VP related to isostatic condition changes and pore pressure changes is similar to the range of delta VP for varied pore types? Good question. Let's have a look. Um, I think we can see that in the data. No? So the range in, can you repeat? Delta VP. Yes, delta VP to isostatic condition changes and pore pressure changes. Similar to the range of delta VP for varied pore types. Ah, um, yeah, I didn't show that plot. I didn't show the plot of delta VP for various pore types. Um, what I recall is that the, 
I, I don't recognize an, a, a, a yes to this question. Okay, what I recall from that plot is that, that you can see the difference between uh, micropores and micropore samples as well. So the micropore samples seem to have larger amplitude in the bars for each of the categories, including for the isostatic samples. Very curious to the motivation of this question though. What, what, what is uh, the hypothesis behind that? I haven't thought about it yet, whether that would make sense to look at. Um, and if it does, then I'm very curious to hear. So, uh, yeah. Uh, maybe that's another one to follow up on again. Yeah, I, I can't, uh, is the amplitude of the bars for them? I don't think, so. yeah. I, Look, all the samples, micropores and mesopores are here plotted, are here shown in this comparison A. And for most samples, you find the same amplitude. It means that um, the, uh, the amplitude is roughly the same. So you, you, you can, there's little distinction that can be made. Right? It, it, does that answer the question or? Um... Sounds like a good answer to me. <laughs> yeah. So if anybody else has questions, make sure you post them into the chat. But we're not getting too many. So clearly it was a very well explained talk you just gave. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I hope so. Maybe we can wait a few more minutes to see if anybody else has any questions. I wonder if it could be on in the direction of the question from um, then the, the one that we are just discussing um, from Thomas Tayet, if it could be a good idea, perhaps showing the VP porosity plot, um, mm -hmm. where you show the the path of each sample. Yeah, that that one, for example, because here what we can see is all the variation in VP. And certainly in here, there are several uh, pore types and uh, we, we are analyzing all that at the moment. But what we can see is, uh, if I read again, the isostatic versus the VP um, in reservoir conditions, you can, you can see here the, the range of variation and mm -hmm. um, perhaps a part you can explain better than me, yeah. but this is enormous, this range from isostatic to reservoir conditions. Yeah. So what the, the range that uh, Conchita is referring to is essentially the difference between the first point, and uh, so the dark blue point for each experiment compared with the, yeah, the green point. So the, the highest point here, these, are re these re represent reservoir conditions, these. So that spread, that range is quite large per, uh, so you can, this, this plot nicely demonstrates the effect of, uh, of, 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 of isostatic versus reservoir stress state, I think on absolute VP value. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we are analyzing at the moment which four types would be, in which four types would have a stronger effect and in which not. But certainly that, that was one of the conclusions from Bart that it's showing the relevance of um, measuring at reservoir conditions in our view, right? Uh, because uh, otherwise um, our values would be in an isostatic could be very different to, to what uh, would be uh, the VP values at reservoir. And for some cases in, in our view, mainly if we want also to correlate with logs, that can be relevant. I'll just ask one more question. Do you have uh, plans to look at more different types of rocks in the future with the same kind of ideas? Um, yeah, but we'll stick to carbonates for now. We really want to focus on carbonates, um, but there is more, um, uh, we're looking at, we're considering other core material uh, that will remain important, of course, for us as a business. Um, and um, yeah, in particular, what I have in mind now, for example, what we have in mind now is to reanalyze data set on a, um, a dolomitized um, yeah, limestone. Of course, that sounds, yeah, dolomitized. Is it basically a dolomite, but it retained the structure of a, uh, of a limestone. So 
Cheetah, please, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, um, um, you, a, you mimic, right... a, case, a case of a mimic dolomitization. Yes, use the so right terminology, the pore, I'm sorry. the pore system is not changing and yeah. all the, the pore structure could be a pore structure similar to a limestone, but in a dolomite mineralogy. So yeah. mainly to check if also is um, showing results similar to the core W that perhaps you can show part. Yeah. Trying this to help. One. Oops. Uh, this one. Yeah. It's core yeah. W. Where we see not much difference um, isostatic versus reservoir conditions. Yeah. So, so little vertical spread per so, uh, per experiment as you can see so what is what is controlling this is because of the pore structure or is the mineralogy and this is why we want to choose uh, an example where the pore structure could be similar to core a but the mineralogy is dolomite exactly yeah mm. yeah. yeah that would be very interesting uh, we have a question from Stephen in Wales um, sorry if I missed this. Is there any intention to look at systems where the pores are occluded or partially occluded by evaporative minerals? Uh, we have, uh, it's a pity that Luke is not here. I'm answering <laughs> everything for Luke. I feel yeah. myself. Just think that it's Luke who is answering, please. <laughs> but we have uh, a data set where uh, part, the pores are partly occluded by anhydrite. And, but then, of course, the issue there is that you have another factor which uh, yeah. is uh, playing a role, which is would be the, the velocity of the anhydrite compared to, in our case, velocity of dolomite. I hope I answered the question. <laughs> but I said, again, if somebody is really uh, interested to follow this up, uh, perhaps contacting Luke Kleipo could be good for the, uh, for the uh, evaporite um, type of plugging. Yeah. All right. So I think um, that will be the end of our presentation this week. So thank you very much for your time. Next week's seminar is at the regular time, 4 p.m. UK, um, when Bitold Suzuki will be talking about <laughs> sedimentology of tsunamis. So we'll see you then. Thank you. Bye.